Hello and welcome to another episode of the Daily Intermittent Fasting Journal, week 14. It looks like I put week four on the Facebook page. It's week 14! Wow! Oh my word, I just turned the sound off too. Oh, I seriously just had a big X on the sound so it would have no sound while I was recording and it came on anyway. So anyway, welcome. It is week 14. Um, in podcast and video cast days. Um, thankfully, I had a bad week this week, so thankfully, I know what the result is. I know that this doesn't continue. So only because I'm a couple weeks behind on the actual podcast presentation. So they're outlined, but they are just um, a couple weeks behind coming up here. So hopefully, you are going to be able to join me live here on the Intermittent Fasting Journal Facebook group where I record these video casts and podcasts. And then, of course, you can also get them if you subscribe to Donna Reish, uh, the blog. They will come to you via a, a blog post um, or via a newsletter. Or they are also available at my YouTube channel, the Intermittent Fasting Journal, and also at Donna Reish YouTube page. So you can find them a few places if you are behind and you want to catch up. Um, it is a journal. It's a journal format. So what that means is that you can jump in at, to week one. If you're just starting fasting, you can jump into week one of the Intermittent Fasting Journal and follow my journey week by week. So if you're new, um, you can see all the same struggles that everybody has when they start doing um, intermittent fasting and just really get some help in the process. So um, that's one reason why I'm excited about this particular format. And this is actually the format for my book as well, the Intermittent Fasting Journal, uh, coming up this summer, um, because it will chronicle my first 24 weeks and teach people how to intermittent fast incrementally. Um, I've written 100 books in other areas, mainly uh, language arts and writing and some parenting and some homeschooling and some speech and some debate and um, some readers and some coloring books and all kinds of things for kids. Um, but this will be, um, and then some things for parents too, but this will be for intermittent fasters to also learn how to intermittent fast incrementally. So um, I'm going to just dig right in here with this week's uh, results. So uh, what I did, first of all, I, um, my, my background was very overweight, <laughs> even more than I, lots more to lose than I have right now to lose. And then uh, my most recent background was attempting low carb. And um, I started trying to low carb about five years ago. And uh, so um, just really uh, did not stay with it enough to have a good weight loss. Then I started supplementation and started losing and started feeling a lot better and doing a lot better. But as far as getting all the way down to my goal, intermittent fasting is taking me there. I'm so excited about that, and my husband too. So, um, but with that background came a lot of um, a lot of uh, interest and uh, and testing and tweaking of low carb. And uh, as a matter of fact, Donna Reish has a hundred recipes of low carb and family friendly and a lower carb um, and moderate carb recipes uh, because that is kind of where I was prior to intermittent fasting. And so I am still very interested in a lot of aspects of low carb, uh, not necessarily keto, not like the 75% fat, 15% protein, 10% carbs or whatever that ratio might be. Not as much that, um, but definitely interested in uh, it because going down to 100 carbs a day is actually what healed my prediabetes before I ever started supplementation and before I ever started intermittent fasting. So I know the effects of cutting back on carbohydrates, cutting back on sugar. And uh, while this group, the Intermittent Fasting Journal group, as well as the upcoming course and my book is not specifically a low carb group, um, I think that one of the things that I want to teach and one of the things that I think is very important is the ability to enjoy whatever you want to enjoy during your feasting window so that we are not locked into um, you know the the old diet mentality um, now with that we also have to get our nutrients in we also have to feel great so what can we do in our feasting window that lets us enjoy food the social aspects of it and the uh, celebratory aspects of it and also 
it helps us to get the nutrition that we need and also helps us to feel really great. I recently heard somebody on a podcast talking about how we have to get away from food as being social and, and everything except for nutrients. We have to get away from it, uh, all aspects of food, except for the nutrition aspects of what it does for our bodies. And I just totally disagree with that. I mean, we have seven children. Most of you who have been listening know that I have seven children, 19 to 35, and five kids in love, uh, four uh, sons-in-laws and daughters, sons-in-law and daughters-in-law, and uh, one to be very in six, uh, seven months. And social eating and celebration is a huge part of our family. And it, as a matter of fact, this weekend, we are getting together. This is our Disney year. So every three to five years, um, it's been four to five, but this year's going to be three. Every three years, we are we take a family Disney trip. And all of us go, and, and hopefully, you know, Lord willing, we're all going to go. That will be 16 of us in total who will go to Disney World in November. And it is a huge, huge deal. I mean, is that's those were our vacations. Every five years with our kids growing up, you know, we would do long weekends and things like that. But every five years was our big family Disney trip um, for about the last 20 years. And so um, this is our year. And this Saturday, we are having our Disney dining plan party. And that means that my son who manages our trip and, and lays it all out and gets all of our reservations and all of our fast passes and everything, uh, we buy the dining plan. And with that, we get together and he has everything laid out and we vote. And whatever restaurants win are the ones that we choose to eat as a, as a family. Uh, food is so celebratory, uh, celebratory, and it is so social. Um, I feel like, uh, and I hope this isn't offensive to anybody, but I feel like it's kind of like saying that sex is only for procreation. You know, I mean, anybody who's ever, <laughs> anybody who has a healthy sex life would not say that you only have sex to have babies, right? You have sex for the enjoyment of sex, and we have food for the enjoyment of food as well. And so uh, I, I don't agree with that. And so with that, we have this feasting window this period of time in which we can feast on what we love, on what gives us our nutrients, and on uh, what um, makes us feel good, right? So for me personally, I probably average now with intermittent fasting like 150 carbs a day. If you average my, you know, like the times that we might go out and I might have a bre piece of bread and, and dessert or I might have pizza night with the kids or, or you know, ice cream or something like that. Um, and then other times at home, I'm just eating, you know, much more healthfully. But, but what we do in our eating window has to really cover all three of those areas. And so, um, but, you know, just like many people in, in intermittent fasting, I wanted it to go faster. <laughs> and this is not uncommon at all in intermittent fasting. If you recall the um, video I did as well as the blog post, five ways that intermittent fasting might seem upside down compared to um, other eating protocols, you might remember that I talked about, one of the things I talked about is that usually with other protocols, you are doing such a drastic change in your life that you lose a lot of weight at first. And it's not uncommon for somebody to go keto or something and lose three pounds a week at first and just really, really be losing weight. Whereas with intermittent fasting, it might be slower but more steady weight loss. And so that's how it's been for me. It's been like three quarters, to nine tenths of a pound a week um, over um, 14 weeks prior to this week that I'm about to tell you about. Um, but, you know, like everybody else, well, what if I did this? What if I added that? What if I subtracted this? All right, so I did a week of um, low carb. Um, I always open my window with low carb. And I talked about that last week in my OMAD divided by three. I always open my window with low carb unless we're out at the time I open my window. But at home, I always open it with something low carb because I that qual that meets one of my three requirements. It makes me feel really good. It, it really helps me uh, not to binge during my eating window. It helps me to divide my OMAD up into three parts. It helps me not to just eat the entire evening and so forth. So. Um, but this particular week, I decided to stay under 50 carbs a day, every day, 
um, or I believe it was really five days a week. And I'm going to talk about that in listener lessons here. Can you sort of keto? Um, I was dreading the counting again, and um, but I decided that, you know, people who do low carb and do intermittent fasting together, they lose a lot of weight faster, right? So let's 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 do that. Let's lose weight faster. Let's you know make this happen faster. Um, I didn't the the things that result wise, I did not look forward to my OMAD, my one meal a day as much as I used to. And I think that there's something to be said for that in the effect that it has on our self-control during our fasting window. Right? If you are uh, looking forward to your eating window and you are, you know, you plan a special dinner, you, you know, you look forward to the meal that you're about to have, um, it is so much easier to fast looking forward to your one meal a day, your whatever that might, whatever that breakdown might be for you. Um, but I definitely didn't look forward to it as much. It was like, oh man, you know, I, I really, really felt like I was back in the low carb jail, so to speak, again. Um, but the one thing that really happened um, that was very obvious to me is that I overate. And I, I think that there's a different way to handle this, um, but I think what happened, which, which made it not as successful for me, was that I didn't focus on my OMAD divided by three during this time. Instead, I focused on my carbs. And I had carbs left, so I ate when I maybe wasn't even really hungry, or I ate something that was carb-free, you know, bacon, spoonful of peanut butter, you know, whatever is low carb or carb free. Um, and I did that rather than focusing on my OMAD divided by three. So I kind of let the counting, I let the carbohydrate level, um, I let that protocol overtake my fasting window. I know that now uh, a couple weeks out because of next week's experiment too. Um, so anyway, um, I, I definitely felt heavy. My pants were starting to get uh harder to fasten because uh, I have a lot of loose clothes right now and that's exciting right and I'm about ready to change you know very soon into my spring wardrobe uh, spring summer wardrobe and I'm excited and looking forward to that because who doesn't want to fit into their smaller clothes that they had that they couldn't fit into last spring and summer right um, but I definitely felt heavy I felt uh, bloated and felt like things were very tight and I gained two pounds so um, Anyway, I have more to say about that as I show you the results of that because now I'm two weeks beyond that. So I've already lost it and I'm feeling great and I know what I did wrong. Uh, but the main thing that I can tell you right now that I did wrong is that I focused on the carbs instead of focused on the carbs or the lack of carbs instead of OMAD. Um, I think that and, and I this really opened my eyes to to people who say, you know, they know they're still eating too much in their eating window. They know they're still eating too much in their eating window. And what happens with that is that when we start eating as soon as we open our window and we just kind of graze all evening without a real meal that makes us go into appetite correction. I'm done. Good. I'm over. Eating is over until tomorrow. I'm really done. That kind of feeling when we do that. Uh, you know, that is that is a built in mechanism for us during intermittent fasting. But I was I was looking at it. This are my this is my four hour window. or This is my five hour window to eat these carbs and no more. And so I really feel like that was very detrimental to me. That is not to say that that would happen to anybody trying to eat low carb during their eating window. I just know that that was my mistake that I made was focusing more on. I can still eat something because this doesn't have carbs or I can still eat this because it doesn't have very many carbs. I'm not over my limit yet, as opposed to still looking at my eating window uh, more carefully the way I have been doing. All right. So I want to move into listener lessons um, <clears throat> because this is a good time to talk about um, keto and low carb uh, with uh, with OMAD. All right. So. As I said before, there are a lot of people who even lose a great deal of weight on 16.8 if they are doing low carb. And um, I am not doing low carb, as I said. I don't count my carbs um, outside of this week. I did not count my carbs. I open with a low carb uh, snack or appetizer or salad. And then I move, when I have my OMAD, I don't even think about my carbs. And when I have my dessert, I don't even think about my carbs. Um, 
with my OMAD breakdown. I don't have to worry about it because I'm not going to overeat with appetite correction and my OMAD breakdown and all the boundaries. I just did a, um, a slideshow about five boundaries um, for intermittent fasters, five for eating for your eating window. So you can check that out at Donna Reach. All right. So um, the, the question is about sort of keto. And I look back on my low carb days prior to intermittent fasting. And I had, you know, a one pound weight loss um, most months over like a 20 month period. Uh, once I started supplementing before that, I had this whole problem of uh, low carb, low carb, low carb, low carb, Friday off, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, eat anything, and then Monday start low carbing again. And so with that, for during those two years, I didn't have a net loss. And um, I think that this speaks to the question of can you sort of keto? Because I, I, I think that um, people have a really hard time losing weight on low carb unless they are so, 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 so faithful to it. And um, I don't have the math in front of me. I do have a, a blog post and a video that I'm working on about this that has the math more in front of me uh, during that time. But the problem is that when you eat low carb, you eat high fat, which is not a problem if you eat low carb, right? Because you're, the low carbers have kind of a built-in padding, so to speak. They can eat more calories, up to 300, research has shown, 270, something like that, um, more calories. And so if you are low carb all the time, which means that you are eating, let's say under 50 carbs, let's not even say you're keto, you know, you're not high fat necessarily and all that, you're just low carb. So in, within this 50 carbs, you are having for your meats, for example, fatty meats, bacon, steak, you know, beef, things like this. And then you are having uh, fats, butter, MCT, uh, coconut oil, fat bombs, you know, dairy, full fat dairy, cheese, egg yolks, nuts. Okay, so you're having a lot of high fat foods. Well, when you kind of keto, or in this case, it's really just kind of low carb. When you kind of low carb, what you do is, you eat low carb, and so suppose you kind of eat, you know, 50 carbs a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday you go off and you eat, you know, you, do, you eat unlimited carbs. But you have already all week long eaten in excess of calories of what your body really needs. And then on Saturday you decide, well, you're going to have another day off. And then on Sunday you decide you're going to have another day off. Well, when you take all seven of those days together, four days of 50 carbs and maybe 150 grams of fat or 200 grams of fat, depending on, you know, 100 to 150 probably. And then you had three days of regular food. What you have just done is not a low carb diet, but a high calorie diet. And so this is, this was now, that, now that I look back prior to supplementation, prior to intermittent fasting, I know that I was doing a high calorie diet because I ate low carb, so I was eating my cream cheese and my nuts and my bacon and my eggs, all of that during the week. And then on the weekends, I would eat whatever I wanted, which made my average for the week way, way more than my body needs. So can you kind of keto? I, I don't think, I think that you can have a, a free meal, so to speak, but I don't think that you can kind of keto in that I'm gonna keto especially when with the true meaning of keto being high carb moderate protein low fat low high fat sorry moderate protein low carb that the true meaning of keto i don't really believe that you can kind of keto and have a weight loss and so i think that this is what trips people up and you see people all the time i know in social media i see it all the time you know i am i am kicking these carbs to the curbs carbs to the curb I'm kicking these carbs to the curb and and you know I'm at 30 carbs you know no more potatoes and sugar for me and stuff like that and then they gradually start adding that stuff back in and then they are just on a high calorie diet and then they wonder why they're not losing I'm kind of low carb I do pretty well on it um, so it's really it really can be uh, a detriment to people to kind of keto so the difference between low carb and keto is of course you can eat low carb 
and still eat like chicken breast and things like that that are moderate protein and no fat. So your calorie intake wouldn't be as high. So uh, when I say I open my window with the low-carb food, I don't necessarily mean I open it with bacon. I might open it with just a, even a, a chick, even a chicken breast with salad, and it might not even ha be very fatty. It could be. I don't really necessarily watch that, but I'm just saying that you either pretty much have to keto or not keto. You can't kind of keto because you end up with way, way, way too many calories. But this leads us to the question that we really started talking about in the first part of this, the three things that you need to do for intermittent fasting. You need to get your nutrients. You need to eat what makes you feel good. And you need to eat what you enjoy. So with those three things, what helps you the most? And this is funny because I'm talking to a lot of adults here, and I just told this to my kids today. I, I teach uh, a lot of private classes and small classes to test my 100 books that I've written for homeschoolers and Christian schools and now for public schools at Teachers Pay Teachers. But I just told them, they said, you know, can I, I always tell them to mark the homework in a certain way. And they said, well, can I, can I uh, put this down instead of putting salt? Can I put um, Dead Sea? for my topic there in the, on my homework sheet. And I said, oh, you put whatever helps you the most. And a little bit later, can I do this? You do whatever helps you the most. And then I tell them, I go into the spill, that you know what helps you the most. When you get home and you're looking at your homework sheet and your mom's questioning what this means or what that means, you know what helps you the most. You know what kind of learner you are, right? They're all so sweet. They're so sweet. I'm so blessed now to teach five-year-olds up to, I don't know how old the oldest person is on here, maybe 75, maybe, who knows, maybe older than that, right? Um, I love, love, love teaching. But that is the same thing that we have to do here. You know what will do those three things for you. What will get you the nutrients you need? What will make you feel good? And what do you enjoy? And that's why for me, opening my window with a low-carb food isn't necessarily a rule because if I'm going out to eat, I just start with my meal. I don't even worry about that. It isn't necessarily a rule that I have to follow or else, but it is. it helps me get my nutrients in. It helps me feel good, right? And then later on, I have my entree, and I totally enjoy my entree. I just took my mom out for uh, a liner or, or dunch, uh, liner or dunch. I don't know whether you, what do we call that intermittent fasting when we have our meal at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock? We don't call that liner or do we call that dunch or do we call that dinner? Anyway, and I totally enjoyed a roll at the restaurant, something that I never would have done in my low-carb days. Um, I always took my own low-carb bread to restaurants. But So we have to do whatever helps us the most. So what is that that helps you the most? Uh, for me, this 50 carbs a day, um, I had a weight gain. That doesn't mean that if you go low carb during your feasting window, you're going to have a weight gain, gain. It just means that I didn't do it right, right, that I didn't, that I wasn't considering fasting first. I really feel like even if you want to bring in another way of eating, whether it's, you know, a certain diet protocol or certain, you know, Whole30 or it's, you know, whole foods only, real foods only or paleo, whatever it might be, that the, the secret, the magic is still going to happen for most of us during the fasting window. And so we want to keep that fasting window as clean and as perfect and as long as we can and as long as our bodies feel good doing it. Right? And then our food intake is the second thing to watch. And then we want to be sure that we're getting these three things, nutrients, feeling good, and enjoying it, right? And um, as long as we are clean fasting and we feel good during the fast and we've done it long enough so that our bodies are fat adapted, I was just thinking today how, how good it felt. I was driving home. It had been 20 hours since I'd eaten. I was driving home from teaching uh, to meet my mom for this late lunch, and it was like, I'm not even really hungry yet. I feel so good, right? But it took me a few weeks of complete and consistent faithfulness to do that. So I hope that that will, I hope that you will also, if you're new, stick with it until you get to that point because it's so worth it. Everything that you feel during the first three to five weeks 
as far as you know feeling badly getting lightheaded you know feeling nauseated during the fa during the fast during that first three to five weeks all that goes away all of that is gone and then you the only thing you feel different as far as whether you ate or didn't eat is that whatever negative effects that you used to have from eating you know like tired in the afternoon from eating a lunch you know a lot of people be real they're really tired in the afternoons from eating a sandwich and french fries or something at noon and those carbs and that fattening food and stuff they, they feel really lightheaded and and tired um, and weak in the afternoons none of that you don't feel any of that and you also don't feel all the desperate hunger either. So it's pretty much amazing. So anyway, I hope that if you're new that you'll stay with us and that I can help you with your intermittent fasting journey as well. I'm going to um, turn on my music here and get ready for my unpaid advertisement about uh, Plexus Supplements. So you can stay on board if you'd like to hear more about the Plexus Supplements. Or if not, I will see you next time on the Intermittent Fasting Journal. People losing pounds, y'all. I saw it all around. Bodies are flaming, full on control. It was so exhilarating when the power is blown. I heard somebody say, Burn, body, burn. Dust in the burn, oh, burn, body, burn. All right. Thank you for staying on. If you chose to stay on, I don't ever want you to feel like that you have to supplement in order to fast because this is not true. Um, I do love Plexus supplements. I think that they help me with my fast, but there are tens and thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, probably people who do fast without supplementation. I know that um, uh, uh, Dr. Fung and um, Jimmy Moore, they have certain supplements that they recommend, even some that uh, I think that they co-create, or at least Jimmy, Jimmy uh, Moore does. I know that Dr. Berg recommends, a, sup, recommends certain supplementation with the fast, but you can fast with supplementation or without supplementation, all right? So you don't necessarily have to uh, take supplements to fast, but if you do want to take supplements, I would love for you to take a look at Plexus because they are all natural, plant-based, no artificial ingredients at all, right down to the coloring and the flavors of anything that is flavored like the uh, Plexus Slim or the shakes. And um, they have made a huge difference. And I was not a supplement person. I didn't take supplements. I had seven kids on one income uh, for 25 years. And so you don't necessarily buy supplements for yourself when you're doing that. You just take care of your kids and, and buy food and things like that and buy lots and lots and lots of school supplies. So that's what I did. <laughs> so anyway, but um, we did start on Plexus two years ago and it has really, really changed our lives and we're really thankful for it. So um, I was, I have been talking about the three aspects of the uh, Triplex. So we have Plexus Slim, which comes in a little individual packet like this and you uh, tear it open and shake it into your water bottle. You don't need a mixer or anything like that. And this is like a Kool-Aid drink, natural energy, carb control, appetite suppressant, uh, pain relief, just amazing. And I talk about um, different supplements each in, at the end of each podcast. So you can find out more details about Plexus Slim on a previous podcast as well. And then the other, there are three parts to the Triplex Slim. BioCleanse, which I talked about in episode um, 13, uh, 12, and um, it is our, uh, um, uh, sorry about that, my thing was still playing, it is a magnesium supplement, and it is fantastic, oxygenizes the whole body, and then this is the third part that I'm going to talk about today, and it is our probiotic called ProBio5. So, um, ProBio5 is the third part of this triplex. And this is what you usually hear people using when they go on Plexus. They'll usually start on the triplex, the three in one. And uh, ProBio5 is especially unique for a lot of reasons. For one thing, I have tried probiotics before with no difference whatsoever. It didn't feel a thing uh, as far as how you feel. And I will say that no matter what you're taking, you should feel different during supplementation. If you don't feel different during supplementation, then you need 
to take different supplements because you should feel something. They should make you feel different. They should make you feel better. They should make you feel stronger. They should make you sleep better. They should make you uh, your appetite suppressed. They should make you uh, car cr uh, crave uh, better foods and crave less carby foods. They should make your uh, your inflammation go down. They should do whatever it is that they say they're going to do. And um, so that was why we started uh, Plexus. We started Plexus for my for my weight loss and then for my husband's uh, inflammation, for his weight loss, but also for his inflammation uh, for his knees uh, because he's trying to avoid knee replacement surgery. And um, so we found that what they said they did, they did. And so that's why we've stuck with them for two years. But ProBio 5 is actually three products in one. And this is what really sets our probiotic apart from other probiotics. Uh, I know that I have friends who are big into supplementation, and when you look in their myriad of, of um, supplement uh, um, products that they have, they have, um, hi, they have um, three uh, products. They have a probiotic, they have an antifungal, and they have a, um, uh, and they have digestive enzymes. And there'll be three different products lined up together. Whereas with ProBio5, we have all three of those in one. So we have the digestive enzymes, we have the antifungal, and the probiotic, the probiotics, the five strains of good bacteria. So it is a proprietary enzyme blend, first of all, with protease, chitinase, chitosinase, I can never say that right, and serapeptase. So a lot of help with inflammation, a lot of help with breaking down bad bacteria. So when you think about um, an antifungal, uh, it is actually going to break down the outside of the bad bacteria in your gut. And so normally, like I said, you would take these other products in addition to your probiotic. So your probiotic will give you good bacteria, but your antifungals will break down the bad bacteria and then a, a BioCleanse sweeps it all away. So um, with this, you don't have to take the other products, you the other like in, in, uh, digestive enzymes or antifungals, because this is going to do all three things in one. So it's going to break down the hard shell of the outer coating of bad bacteria, and then at, you're gonna get rid of that bad bacteria through elimination and other processes, and then you are going to be replacing it with good bacteria. So uh, promotes digestive health, healthy immune system, uh, helps with the digestive enzymes, which a lot of people have, you know, like, I just can't eat that. I just can't eat this. You know, they'll have different things that they, they just can't handle. The digestive enzymes in ProBio5 will definitely help with that. Um, and then lastly, with the uh, five strains of good bacteria, they are um, ones that are uh, clinically proven to help with um, yeast overgrowth and with um, the bad bacteria that are associated with carb cravings, brain fog, and those kind of things. So um, I was having a lot of brain fog before. Uh, I started on uh, Triplex and I was very, very concerned because I'm a speaker, I'm a teacher. That's what I do every single day of my life. <laughs> and uh, so, so thankful to have found these products. So this is our Triplex combo here, and if you email me or comment below, I can um, answer questions about them specifically. Uh, I will answer one question. This is about breaking the fast with Plexus Slim. You know that I promote a clean fast, and that means that you don't take any fat or any flavors during your um, fast, and I have a um, video, uh, five things to consume during the fasting window. It's also a it's a video and it's also a slideshow at DonnaReach.com. Five things to consume during the fast. And one of the things not to consume is something with fat or any, any food item at all or anything that's flavored. And so with that, then people automatically say, well, then you can't take Plexus Slim while you're fasting. And I will say that I experimented with it at 11 o'clock during my fast and at 4 o'clock after my fast was already broken. And I was able to keep it at 11 o'clock without any bad effects on my fast. Now, it is flavored, and, and, the, and the thing is that normally fruit flavors are something that m might elicit an insulin response. So you'll have to experiment for yourself to see if it does this. My thinking was that it would not, that if it elicits 
and insulin response because of the flavors. It's not because of the calories, because only five calories, but because of the stevia and the fruit flavors. If it, ex if it elicits an insulin response, then that will cause you to want to eat. And so with that, then that's where it comes like, oh, well, then I can't take it during the fast. That's why you're not supposed to take like cinnamon tea or apple flavored tea or, you know, cocoa flavored coffee or those type of things because they can spike your insulin and cause you to, dis to, to crave foods, right? Which is, you know, we don't need anything causing us to want to eat during the fasting window. Um, but this actually lowers insulin levels. It is actually clinically proven. It was actually created for diabetics to start with, to lower their insulin levels. And so my thinking was, I'm going to experiment with this because I can't imagine that the sweet taste of this would undo the insulin lowering properties of the slim. And so I experimented with it at 10 o'clock and I experimented with it at five, at four o'clock. And um, I went, I mean, 11 o'clock and then at four o'clock and I went back to the 11 o'clock. So I do drink this during my fast. So that's um, this is a purely personal decision, and some people would say, well, then that's not a clean fast anymore. Um, I'm not drinking Kool-Aid. I'm not drinking Crystal Light. Uh, I have done lemonade a lot before I started clean fasting, and it did make me want to <laughs> want to eat all the time. I was having a terrible time, even with a 16-hour fast. But that has not been the case at all. So I take my Slim and my two accelerators, which are my car my caffeine pills that are fat burners. I take those um, at 11 o'clock every day. So, but you can definitely wait and open your fast with this and still have the same benefits of regulating your blood sugar, balancing your blood sugar, uh, giving you uh, self-control, mood enhancement. It is just an amazing product. So anyway, I really appreciate those of you who stayed on to listen, and um, I would love to tell you more about intermittent fasting or um, Plexus products anytime. Thanks again. Yeah. I love this song. Yeah.